Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. Through seven episodes, we've been exploring the great cities of early Christian history, and we've spent a lot of time in the East. Today, we're going back to the West, all the way to the capital of Gaul, Lugdunum, today's Lyon. But as we'll see, we're taking some of the East with us. Today, Lyon is the second city of France, at least in terms of metropolitan population. Lugdunum was hardly less important in its own time. The thing that makes the city so important, then and now, is its location. It's about 200 miles up the Rhone from the Mediterranean, but the river is navigable all the way. That makes it the natural point where everything from the interior of Gaul collects for shipment out to the rest of the world and where everything coming into Gaul pauses before it goes on its way. A city with that advantage attracted traders, and the thriving economy attracted every other kind of people. You could see everyone from everywhere in Lugdunum. In particular, it had a large population of Greek speakers from Asia Minor, in the eastern half of the empire, and it was probably among those Greek speakers that Christianity first took root. We don't know when the good news first came to Lugdunum. It's likely, though, that it was very soon after Christianity started to spread. With so many people passing through the city from all parts of the Roman world, some of the very earliest Christians must have reached the place. It was a small group for a while, but by the middle of the 100s, the church in Lugdunum was big enough to need its own bishop, Pothinus, who was sent there by St. Polycarp the disciple of John the Apostle. So the Christian community continued to grow until the year 177, when the church in Lyon suddenly got some very unwelcome attention. Under the virtuous, stoic philosopher-emperor Marcus Aurelius, there were more persecutions than there had been before. Whether because of the emperor or in spite of him is still up for debate. One of the persecutions we happen to know about in detail was the one in Lugdunum, because the church in Gaul sent a circular letter to the churches in the east, detailing the heroism of the martyrs. Most of that letter still survives, thanks to the church historian Eusebius, who loved original sources more than any other ancient historian. Eusebius introduces the story by giving us the geographical setting. Here's what he says. The country in which the arena was prepared for them was Gaul of which Lugdunum and Vienna are the principal and most celebrated cities. The Rhone passes through both of them, flowing in a broad stream through the entire region. We should note, by the way, that the Vienna mentioned here is not the famous one in Austria, but a smaller city about 20 miles south of Lugdunum. It's called Vienne today, and it still preserves its Roman theater and other landmarks of ancient times. From here, Eusebius gives us the text of the letter sent by the surviving Christians, or at least most of it. He summarizes parts that he thinks are not as relevant to the story. But what he has preserved is a very detailed account of one of the early persecutions. This is how it begins. The servants of Christ residing at Vienna and Lugdunum in Gaul, to the brethren throughout Asia and Phrygia, who hold the same faith and hope of redemption, peace and grace, and glory from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. We note that the letter is sent specifically to the Christians of Asia and Phrygia, places in the east from which many of the Christians of Lugdunum had come. It suggests that the church in Lugdunum considered itself a daughter church of these eastern churches. The writers tell us that things were suddenly very bad for the Christians. Listen. The greatness of the tribulation in this region, and the fury of the heathen against the saints, and the sufferings of the blessed witnesses, we cannot recount accurately, nor, indeed, could they possibly be recorded. 
For with all his might the adversary fell upon us, giving us a foretaste of his unbridled activity at his future coming. In every way he tried to stir up his servants against the servants of God, not only shutting us out from houses and baths and markets, but forbidding any of us to be seen anywhere at all. Now, we don't know exactly what new rules these were that were such a burden to the Christians. We also don't know why the persecution came up at this time rather than any other. But the letter mentions that, quote, they endured nobly the injuries heaped upon them by the populace, shouting and blows and draggings and robberies and stonings and imprisonments and all things which an infuriated mob delight in inflicting on enemies and adversaries. So we can guess that there may have been an anti-Christian riot, and the local government responded by appeasing the mob and giving them the show they wanted. The letter continues, Then they were taken to the forum by the tribune and the authorities of the city, and they were examined in the presence of the whole multitude. And when they had confessed, they were imprisoned until the arrival of the governor. The governor, the letter tells us, was equally inclined to give the mob a good show and treated the accused with cruelty and contempt. Under the torture, some of them fell away and recanted their Christianity. The letter says, quote, And some of our heathen servants also were seized, as the governor had commanded that all of us should be examined publicly. These, being ensnared by Satan and fearing for themselves the tortures which they beheld the saints endure, and being also urged on by the soldiers, accused us falsely of Thyestean banquets and Oedipodian intercourse. In other words, cannibalism and incest, two of the most common wild rumors about the Christians. The letter continues, And of deeds which are not only unlawful for us to speak of or to think, but which we cannot believe were ever done by human beings. This accusation made the mob even more furious, and even the few friends the Christians had among the pagans decided it wasn't safe to be their friends anymore. From here, the letter goes on to describe the sufferings of the martyrs who endured every torture the ingenuity of the enlightened Roman civilization could invent. Of all of them, though, the one who was remembered most was the young slave Blandina through whom, the letter says, Christ showed that things which appear mean and obscure and despicable to men are with God of great glory, through love toward him manifested in power and not boasting in appearance. For while we all trembled, and her earthly mistress, who was herself also one of the witnesses, feared that on account of the weakness of her body she would be unable to make bold confession, Blandina was filled with such power as to be delivered and raised above those who were torturing her by turns from morning till evening in every manner, so that they acknowledged that they were conquered and could do nothing more to her. And they were astonished at her endurance, as her entire body was mangled and broken. And they testified that one of these forms of torture was sufficient to destroy life, not to speak of so many and so great sufferings. But the blessed woman, like a noble athlete, renewed her strength in her confession, and her comfort and recreation and relief from the pain of her sufferings was in exclaiming, I am a Christian, and there is nothing vile done by us. The others endured similar treatment. Some of them died. Some of them should have died, but they seemed to revive miraculously in prison. Pothinus, the aged bishop, was beaten and died from the mistreatment soon afterward. At last, the usual show was arranged. The Christians were to be torn to shreds by wild animals in the theater for the delight and amusement of the good citizens. But as the letter tells us, there were some disappointments in that show. Listen. But Blandina was suspended on a stake and exposed to be devoured by the wild beasts who should attack her. And because she appeared as if hanging on a cross, and because of her earnest prayers, she inspired the combatants with great zeal. For they looked on her in her conflict, and beheld with their outward eyes in the form of their sister him who was crucified for them, that he might persuade those who believe on him that every one who suffers for the glory of Christ has fellowship always with the living God. 
and none of the wild beasts at that time touched her. She was taken down from the stake and cast again into prison. Tortures and trials went on for days. More Christians, inspired by the courage of the martyrs, confessed and were seized. At last Blandina's time for martyrdom came, as the letter tells us. After all these, on the last day of the contests, Blandina was again brought in, with Ponticus, a boy about fifteen years old. Ponticus encouraged by his sister, so that even the heathen could see that she was confirming and strengthening him, having nobly endured every torture, gave up the ghost. But the blessed Blandina, last of all, having as a noble mother encouraged her children and sent them before her victorious to the king, endured herself all the conflicts and hastened after them, glad and rejoicing in her departure as if called to a marriage supper rather than cast to wild beasts. And after the scourging, after the wild beasts, after the roasting seat, she was finally enclosed in a net and thrown before a bull. And having been tossed about by the animal, but feeling none of the things which were happening to her, on account of her hope and firm hold upon what had been entrusted to her and her communion with Christ, she also was sacrificed. And the heathen themselves confessed that never among them had a woman endured so many and such terrible tortures. The cruelty did not end, even after the martyrs were dead. The governor made sure the Christians would have no relics. The bodies were closely guarded, and then they were burned, and the ashes were swept into the Rhone. This precious letter is one of the most detailed accounts we have of a Roman persecution, but it leaves out the name of probably the most famous Christian, aside from Blandina, who ever lived in Lugdunum. That's because he had been sent with a letter to Rome. Irenaeus was a priest in Lugdunum when the persecution broke out. The Christians in prison sent him with a letter about the Montanist heretics in Lugdunum, hoping that their present suffering would add authority to their words. What was their message? We don't know. That letter has been lost over the many centuries between them and us. But it did mean that Irenaeus was in Rome when the news came that Pothinus the bishop had died. Who would replace him? Here was an obvious candidate. Irenaeus was sent back as bishop, and his first duty would be to mop up after the persecution. Who was this Irenaeus? Like Pothinus, he had come from Asia Minor. When he was young, Irenaeus had known St. Polycarp, the disciple of the Apostle John. He wrote, I remember where Polycarp used to sit when he taught. I remember the places he used to go, how he lived, what he looked like, the speeches he made to the crowds, the things he told us about his conversation with John and others who saw the Lord, how he remembered their sayings and what he heard from them about the Lord, about his power in teaching, repeating the precepts and everything that matched Holy Scripture out of the mouths, as I said, of those who themselves had seen the word of life in the flesh with their own eyes. What this means was that Irenaeus was three steps away from Jesus himself. Jesus, John, Polycarp, Irenaeus. That was the chain of tradition. He knew Polycarp in Smyrna, the city in Asia Minor. How did Irenaeus get to Gaul? Some scholars think he was sent there by Polycarp himself, on the grounds that the church in Lugdunum was a daughter church of the church in Smyrna. Others think Irenaeus was still in Smyrna when Polycarp was martyred and left for Gaul some time afterward. Either way, it seems to have been natural that the church in Lugdunum would be looking eastward for priests. Of the martyrs mentioned by name in the letter Eusebius recorded for us, half have Greek names. That still leaves half who are either native to Lugdunum or from elsewhere in the west, and that native element was growing. Irenaeus would have been able to get along well in Greek with a good number of the Christians and some of the traders who had settled in Lugdunum, but he would have had to learn Latin to make himself useful to the growing church there. Years later, at the beginning of his magnum opus, he wrote, You will not expect from me, living as I do among the Celts, and used to speaking a barbarous dialect most of the time, any display of rhetoric, which I have never learned. End of quote. 
He was writing in Greek, which was the language of educated people. Marcus Aurelius, the emperor during the persecution of the martyrs of Lugdunum, was a Westerner, but his famous book of meditations was written in Greek because it was written for an educated audience. But in daily life, it was more and more necessary for Irenaeus to speak Latin as the church grew. The years after the spectacular persecution were years of peace for the most part. The church grew rapidly in Lugdunum. With that rapid growth came the same problems other churches were having. Teachers who professed to be Christians were teaching radically different sorts of Christianity. In Irenaeus' time, they were mostly Gnostics. Gnosticism is a kind of catch-all term for a range of beliefs that have the idea of secret knowledge at their core. Thus the name from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. Christian Gnostics taught that there was one doctrine for the dull and stupid masses, but the real truth was reserved for us, the few insiders, and for you if you pay your fees to the Gnostic teacher. Irenaeus tells us specifically that the Gnostic's disciples had to pay a high price for an acquaintance with such profound mysteries. This esoteric doctrine was expressed in impenetrable jargon that sure sounded impressive. Faced with this problem, Irenaeus sat down to write one of the most ambitious works yet undertaken by a Christian thinker. He called it something like, So-Called Knowledge Refuted and Overturned but it's usually known as Against Heresies. It's nothing less than an encyclopedia of the various sects of Gnostics, along with Irenaeus's explanations of why they're wrong. We can hardly admire Irenaeus enough merely for having the patience to wade through the pretentious meanderings of the Gnostics. Their torturous mythology is full of aeons and proarches and generations and emanations and dozens of characters with symbolic names, and Irenaeus dutifully catalogs them all for us. But when he had to deal with Valentinus, his patience broke at last, and he was overcome by, by the most memorable fit of sarcasm in the history of early Christianity. He wrote, Obviously, Valentinus himself is the one who was bold enough to come up with these names, so that unless he had appeared in the world, the truth would still have been nameless. But if that's true, there's nothing to stop anyone else who deals with the same subjects from giving them names like this. There is a certain proarche, royal, surpassing all thought, a power existing before every other substance and extended into space in every direction. But along with it, there exists a power, which I term a gourd. And along with this gourd, there exists a power, which again I term utter emptiness. This gourd and emptiness, since they are one, produced, and yet did not simply produce, so as to be apart from themselves, a fruit, everywhere visible, eatable, and delicious, which fruit language calls a cucumber. Along with this cucumber exists a power of the same essence, which again I call a melon. These powers, the gourd, utter emptiness, the cucumber, and the melon, brought forth the remaining multitude of the delirious melons of Valentinus. Today Valentinus and his like are long forgotten, except by specialists in Christian history. You'll find many people who like to mourn the alternative Christianities supposedly suppressed by the early church which, as an illegal underground cult, hardly had the power to suppress anybody. But their enthusiasm usually wanes when they actually have to read what those Gnostics believed. St. Irenaeus set a high standard for bishops of Lugdunum. Some traditions say he died a martyr, but those are late and unreliable. He may have died of old age, but he was a tough act to follow. Nevertheless, in the centuries after him, we find a lot of bishops with saint in front of their names. Irenaeus' successors were living up to their great model. The city of Lugdunum suffered in the Dark Ages, like the rest of the cities of the West, but it survived better than most, and Charlemagne built it up into a famous center of learning. Today, Lyon is littered with monuments of 20 centuries of Christian history, but perhaps no two figures are more celebrated than St. Irenaeus, the great theologian, and St. Blandina, the heroic martyr. 
I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Way of the Fathers. And if you did, I ask you to consider making a donation to help us. We are entirely listener-funded, and so we're utterly dependent on you. So please go now to our form at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Make your donation and let us know that you love the fathers. And remember, we pray for our listeners and benefactors every day. De quorum solemnitate gauden tangeli et collaudant filium dei. Way of the Fathers is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. And the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.